Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this very special session. I am thrilled to introduce our guest, Dr. Mario Martinez. Mario is a clinical neuropsychologist who lectures worldwide on how cultural beliefs affect health and longevity. He is the founder of Biocognitive Science, a new paradigm that investigates the causes of health and the learning of illnesses in cultural context. Welcome, Mario. I am so looking forward to talking with you. Thank you. That was a mouthful. Let's see if I can uh, live up to it. <laughs> <laughs> so I I am really excited to chat with you because I know that you are really on the cutting edge of research when it comes to empaths and how the brain processes empathy and why empaths respond the way that they do. So can you just tell us a little, just a little introduction about some of the new research that you discovered that our listeners today are going to get to learn more about? Yes. Uh, first, uh, evolutionarily, uh, empathy was a, a fear response. It was just a fear response that uh, if you're a zebra or you're a cave person, you saw something happening to somebody there was no empathy there. It was just the fear to run. And you still see that with zebras when the lion comes and, and it begins to eat one, they all run. And that comes from the mirror neurons that, that you know about. And the mirror neurons are in the uh, pre-motor uh, uh, cortex and, and it tells you whether you need to move or not. So empathy evolutionarily was just a way of protecting yourself by seeing the pain of others and running from the danger. And then, of course, it evolved. So, but that's the beginning of it. So is empathy actually, um, would you put that in the category of sort of the fight, flight, fear, or, or freeze and fawn states? Or is it sort of an offshoot of those? The fight or flight, uh, well, it, it, it's a bit like it. But when you look at the word empathy, for example, it's good to look at the etymology because these are wise people who came up with words to reflect what we were feeling. So the word didn't exist before 1990, uh, 1909, uh, Titchener was the one who introduced the word and he, he brought it from the German N, which means in pathos uh, feeling, so in feeling. Before there was empathy, the word was sympathy, which was different, which means sim, uh, uh, sympathy is with feeling. So you'll see how words can affect the brain as, as we move along with this, but it, it's a fairly new word. And, uh, and, and as you know, it's a very small group of people that are real empaths, about three to four percent. The rest are people that have uh, sensitivities, but they get misdiagnosed. But I, as I will explain, and um, but the the main idea is to understand that empathy by itself is actually damaging to the individual, and this is why people have so many problems when they're empathic. Yeah, well, and even as you're explaining what the word really means, to be in the feeling. I'm thinking about as an empath, how I tend to pick up on the unwanted emotions that others are feeling or the, you know, what we might call negative emotions, although there's some judgment when we use that language, that as an empath, we tend to um, pick up on those, you know, sad, doldrum, you know, lonesome emotions that others are feeling. And as an empath, to be in those feelings that aren't even ours, that are actually somebody else's, it can really be damaging. It is because uh, the brain has a part that uh, the, the Buddhists say that there's no self, there is a self. It's not a an entity, an entity, but it's a process. Why do we know we have a self? Well, the insula and the prefrontal lower part of the brain, the midbrain, when you have damage there, you don't know who you are. So there's a self, but it's a processing self. Not You can't go to the brain and say, this is self. But there's a processing self that tells you, yesterday I was Mario, and I continue to be Mario. Otherwise, you would be an amoeba. So that's, that's very important. But what happens is that evolutionarily, as I said, initially it was a fear response for the danger of others to run. And sometimes what happens with empaths, because they have very... Um, active mirror uh, neurons, they pick up on the information and they don't distinguish between self and other at the brain level. So then the brain is saying, let's go to the amygdala. That's the part that, that has to do with, with creating the, uh, the hormones and then the amygdala sends information to hypothalamus and, and you get all the stress hormones. It can't differentiate between this is me and this is them. So what I'll be talking about is how to differentiate 
to teach the brain that you can feel something for somebody, but it's not you. And that's the problem. So we have to go to the next step to, to make it from a signal of danger to a signal of understanding of others, but not being sick with the others. Yes. So how do we do that? You know, I, I'm an, I identify as an empath, so you're speaking to me directly. So, <laughs> so what does that look like? How do we, um, you know, I don't want to say put up a barrier because that, you know, it seems like we need to protect ourselves. And I'm thinking that what you're going to share with us is a strategy to sort of identify what's going on and take a more proactive approach to it. Yes, and one of the problems what we have with the empath, which is a gift and, and a burden, is that society wants you to be that way. So a, an extreme example of that would be Mother Teresa. She was a total empath and she had terrible, terrible health, heart problems and diabetes, because there was no way to cut that out. So, for example, the main thing is to understand that at the intellectual level, but it doesn't work at the intellectual level, that, as you know. And by the way, uh, for quite a while as a clinical psychologist, I, I did my training in a hospital and worked, and I was I thought I was a, a hypochondriac. <laughs> so I realized that I'm not a hypochondriac, I'm someone who has the, the, the empathic. So I had to learn to deal with it because otherwise imagine what happens. Every day you see six, seven patients with all kinds of problems and you pick it up and you take it home with you. And it's not energy. What you're doing is your your mirror neurons pick up on the person, whatever's going on, and you're very good at picking up what's going on. Then you begin to feel it as if it's you. So you're not helping anybody. But when you learn that the self and the brain is the one that differentiates the two, then you the question would be, okay, so how do you access that? How do you access that self so that it can say, this is happening to you, and I feel sorry for you, but that's not me. And that's where compassion comes in. Compassion is diff very different. Compassion is a word that says, rather than I am with your feelings, I am for your feelings, but it's still me. Yes. It's still me. So one of the techniques, which I'll ex explain later, very simply, let's say you see somebody who's hurting. And immediately you're, you know that your mirror neurons are going to go there and you're going to start feeding it. So rather than intellectually saying, that's not me, it's not going to work. The, the brain needs to embody things. You can go and, and, and say, thank you for reminding me to take care of myself. And then you embody that. You just don't say thank you. You embody, see how it feels. The moment you do that, the brain is saying, okay, since you're looking at self, let me light up self. And it's also psychoneurology is saying, since you're talking about compassion and experiencing it, I'm going to give you dopamine rather than stress hormones. And you have to practice it. And you have to practice it to because the default mode is, is the, um, the goggles you look at the world with. And the default mode now is set up for empathy. And, and then it affects you because you're going to be feeling everything that's going on. By the way, you're not helping anybody when you're being an empath. Compassion. What it does is it says, I feel for you, and let me see if I can do anything for you. If I can't, then thank you for reminding me to take care of myself. And then you use the foreign measurables in a, later, as I explained, in a way that is for the Western mind, not for the Eastern mind. So as I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, empaths who don't know this, do they become fatigued? Do they become ill? Like, like you know, what tend, what happens to the empath who isn't aware of the damage that they yes. can do to themselves by being so in that empathy state? That's a great question because they get misdiagnosed as hypochondriacs, anxiety disorders, uh, depression, panic attacks, and it's none of that. And what happens though, and also by the way, there's no such thing as compassion fatigue. You never get fatigued with compassion. There's empathy fatigue, and they're different than burnout. So for example, burnout means if you've been working too hard for a long time and you haven't given your system a time to rest. Empathic fatigue is what you're saying. You're out there, you don't know you're getting all that damage, and if you go take a break and go to the Bahamas and come back within two weeks, you have empathy fatigue again because it has nothing to do with being tired. It has to do with overexerting your emotions and creating stress 
rather than sympathy, sympathy or, or compassion. So that's a great question. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, people get misdiagnosed and they go to the doctor and say, well, uh, do some behavioral therapy or do some uh, uh, meditation. It's not that. So empathic fatigue is specifically needs to be treated with the way that I'm talking about here. So as I'm listening to you talk about empathic fatigue, I'm thinking, oh man, I think I have that. Maybe not to the degree that you're describing it, but um, I'm thinking about how I'm moving through life. And so, so what's the answer? <laughs> what's the anecdote? What is in the anecdote? What is, um, you know, if it's, if it's not, about you know uh, going on vacation or or the self care that so many people talk about. Yeah, is it about shifting the way that we're moving through experiences? Is it? Can you can you walk us through what it is that we have to do to move into that compassion state rather than being in that empathic fatigue? You have to change the default mode because the brain is, is not reductionistic. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist and I don't see us as a reductionist. The brain is not a machine; it's an ecology. So the, when you say I'm selfing and the brain goes to the insula, it doesn't mean you're selfing because of the insula. It means you're making the insula light up. It's a mind-body connection. So it's, not a, it's, it's an ecology. So the first thing to understand is the things that we talked about, that empathy is not necessarily good. <laughs> uh, it's, not, it's not a good emotion because it was made specifically to protect you from danger. You have to move from empathy to compassion. Now, here's the problem. That if you do, for example, the four immeasurables, the four immeasurables, uh, uh, as you know, in Tibetan Buddhism and so forth, are, are really very good to a certain degree. The first is, uh, for example, it's um, the loving kindness. Uh, when you, you send, uh, I, I wish all sentient beings uh, to be happy and to find the the um, cause of their happiness, then you go to compassion, and that's not real compassion. Is uh, I um, I wish that all sentient beings end their suffering and that they find the key, uh, cause of their sufferings. That exacerbates the problem with empathy, because you're saying this is what I'm feeling for you. What about me? No, no, no. There's some some Rinpoche, so who uh, Sopa Rinpoche, and they teach no. It's all for the others, not for you. You don't. You're not important. And that's a mistake. That's a spiritual materialism that, that, that uh, uh, Trump uh, talked about. Uh, my mentor, one of my mentors, uh, Rinpoche, he had diabetes and he had all kinds of problems, uh, arthritis. And I asked him, could I help you? And he would just smile. Smile means leave me alone because you're not interested in self. But a Western, you have to be interested in self, even the Eastern, because if you're not interested in yourself, you're not gonna be around very much to give compassion. So compassion has to be inclusive. So you have, well, back to your question, what do you do when you're feeling all these things? And by the way, the, 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 diff the reason that you get so exhausted is because you have a adrenaline drain. The adrenaline is putting out all kinds of norepinephrine, epinephrine, cortisol, and after a while you're, you're, you're drained, even though you haven't done anything. You just saw four or five people in the day. So then, one way, and this is what I do in my work, I do a lot of uh, brain retraining. One way to do it is I pick that up as a signal to use the immeasurables for me. So for example, let's say I see you, and by the way, the area of the brain that activates when you're empathic is the area of the brain that causes crying. <laughs> very, very related. Um, so I see you hurting, and I can tell you I'm sorry you're hurting, but then I go back. And I say, here's a signal for me to use loving kindness for me. May I be happy? May I find the cause of my happiness? May I end my suffering? May I end the, or may I find the causes of my suffering? Immediately, the fault mode will say, you're being selfish, you're being uncaring. Oh, that's a signal for me to do it again. <laughs> you see? So what you're doing is you're retraining your brain. Why? Because society and culture teach you to be collectivist at the expense of self. It doesn't mean that you don't care. The shifting to compassion, compassion has a different um, um, etymology. Compassion says, I feel for you, not with you. And then what you want to do, compassion, what it does is it says, 
if if I feel this for you, what can I do for you? If there's nothing I can do, then I want to be a model of what you could be. And when you become a model of what you could be, you self again, you do selfing again. And the brain says, since you're in a consciousness of selfing, let me go back to the insula. Okay, now no more um, stress hormones. So, so that's a processing. And I'll, you know, we'll expand on it as, as we talk, but that's basically some of the ideas. Uh, and, and going back to the medieval times, they had these, what they call the sin eaters, which were the first empaths. The sin eaters would come and you were dying and the family would bring a sin eater. They would put some bread on your chest and then the, the sin eater would eat the bread and would take all his, the sins with you, with him. So that's how they were, they were getting the, uh, uh, the freedom from, from the sins. And, and the sin eaters were people that, that they were so destitute that that's all they could do because they couldn't get much money. And they, interestingly, they, they weren't very sick, even though they were isolated from, because they thought they were doing something for society, but it wasn't them. So when you absorb the sins, they're not my sins, they're their sins. So even there, at that extreme level, it still wasn't causing problems for them because of the selfing. So if I can say it back so that I'm really clear here, the selfing is really about creating a deliberate distinction between self and other. That's right. Whereas that um, unhealthy empathic experience is a blending. It's a, a, a full sort of um, enmeshing of the two yes. of self and other and not having the distinction. And therefore the brain releases chemicals that are detrimental to the self because it's experiencing the other as the self. Did I get exactly. that right? And some philosophies will say, oh, that's good because you're one with the world. No, you're not. You don't want to be one with the world. You want to be one in the world. And that's very important information, including for Buddhists, very important information. So, but it cannot be done intellectually. It has to be, it has to be embodied and it has to be enacted. If you say, oh, that's not me. Forget it. It's not going to work. The brain doesn't pick up on that. It has to be an embodied thing. And then the enactment means that, let's go back to the experience. Let's say that I see you hurting and I tell you, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry you're hurting. Is there anything I can do? Then internally I go, okay, now Melissa is a stimulus for me to do my empathic joy and all that kind of thing. And then what can I do to continue to confirm that I am a happy, good person and that I'm dealing with my with the end of my suffering? then the brain begins to change that because it's embodied and it's enacted. So fascinating. So I'm noticing that so far when we talk about empaths, we're really talking about them over responding to the pain of others. Now I'm curious because as an empath myself, I notice that I tend to tune into that more than the joy but what are your thoughts on being in empathy, being in that empathic um, experience and enmeshing with the joy, with the the upliftment, with the wonderful that's out in the world, and losing the sense of self in in there is that of benefit? Is it still more beneficial to be of self in the world rather than than feeling that blend? How does it work when we're talking about those wanted, positive, loving, uplifting feelings? I'm smiling because you're coming up with some incredibly brilliant questions. <laughs> and there is, uh, now that you asked, there's some very, very recent research. Nobody was looking at how, as you said, how empaths respond to, to joy, to the joy of others. And the functional MRIs are really good. We've learned a lot about the brain and we learned about, it's, it's um, real time seeing what the brain is doing. So what they did is they, they looked at, okay, let's look at some empaths and let's look at how, they, how the brain responds when they're being empaths. And let's see how the brain responds when they see joy in others. What they found was that highly activated when there's pain out there, very low activated when there's joy out there. So what that says is that um, I'm not tuning into your joy as much as uh, to your pain. One of the reasons might be subconsciously that if you admire someone, you might feel envy. The other one is that you haven't developed, you haven't that cultivated that part of you. So that's another thing that we can do. We can cultivate empathy uh, in a way with, with joy. But we, now we can go to the third enmeshable, which is the, uh, as you know, the, 
the uh, empathic joy, which means that I can feel the joy for others. Okay, that's good, but not when they're having pain. You can go and say, my friend just got a tremendous promotion. Let me feel the, the celebration of her promotion and let me embody it. That is very good. But here's a mistake that the Buddhists make. And I've worked with many uh, uh, lamas and nuns. They do the, the third immeasurable because they don't believe that there's anger. And then because of what happened with Tibet, what happened with uh, the nuns were were raped and, and they burned their uh, temples. They first have to experience what, what I call righteous anger. They have to experience righteous, righteous anger is one of the causes of health. Uh, George Solomon, my mentor who created psychoneurology, discovered that, that righteous anger is good within a context. So let's say you're a, a, a Buddhist monk and you want to send uh, empathic joy to the Chinese, you first have to get angry with them. You right. deal with the anger, and then you do the empathic joy. But for the empaths of the West, you don't have to get angry. You just look for people that that you like and people that uh, that that you really want to celebrate their, their goodness and see if there's a little bit of envy there. Because, by the way, if you feel admiration... You secrete dopamine just like with compassion. Mm. But if you have admiration with envy, it cancels that. Wow. So sometimes, and we all have a little bit, you might say, well, I, I'm glad that Melissa just got a $100,000 raise. I'm a little envious. Okay, breathe into that. Release it and go back. I'm glad that till you get the, the, the admiration. And when you get the admiration, you kick in dopamine. All kinds of good things happen. So the empath to kind of bring it together, the empath kicks in stress hormones. Compassion, well done, kicks in dopamine. It's just like cocaine. It's the centers of, and, and when, when you're, for example, with uh, addicts, dopamine kicks in and you get very excited about the anticipation of the drug and you don't get as much with the drug than with the anticipation because dopamine stops when the drug comes in. So could we, in effect, get high on compassion? Yeah, that's why you don't have fatigue. Ah. But real compassion, not not um, caretaker, because that's not compassion. Real yeah. compassion means I'm really excited about my joy, and I'm really excited about your joy, and you just, I mean, you're you're immunologically, you're creating all kinds of powerful protections. Wow, I don't know if you can even answer this, but if we now have come to this understanding that empathy is not a beneficial emotion. Um, why, why do empaths exist? What is, what is the upside of being an empath? Well, it's really good because you can still have the, the reading ability of the pain out there. It's really good to see that. But what you don't want to do is you don't want to leave it there. So, like if you have a, a gift and you don't know how to go, to go to the next step of the gift, so the gift becomes a problem for you. But the other thing about it is that uh, when, you're, when you're empathic, you're spending a lot of time then cleaning up what you put out there. You spend a lot of time with fear, a lot of time with dealing with the, with the stress hormones that you created, so you don't have a very happy life. And then self-esteem goes down, and then you look for a high trying to help others. But the other thing about it is if you're too empathic, what are you avoiding? Uh. What are you avoiding here? And are you avoiding one of the archetypal wounds, for example, uh, of, um, as you know, from biocognition, you have archetypal wounds all over. I call them archetypal because I see them in every culture. It's either abandonment, uh, shame, or betrayal. Also, some people are taught very early that they they weren't children. They They were adults early in life. They had parents who were alcoholics and parents that didn't care, they became the little adults. They never had time to play. And they found that the only way they could be loved is by taking care of other people. That's not empathy, that's caretaking. So you have to look at yourself and ask, well, why am I doing this? Where did I learn this? What happened? And, and I know where I learned it. I know that when I was nine years old, I had a car accident, had three broken ribs. And I, in those days, oh, I just get over it. It was PTSD. Mm. So I became very aware of my body. 
And I was already empathic in that sense, but then I became aware of everybody's body. <laughs> they had all kinds of problems with it. constant uh, uh, hypochondriasis and anxiety and all that. Till finally, I realized what was going on and was able to change it and then teach other people about it. This is, this is research that you don't see it anywhere because I'm putting it together from different disciplines that yes. they don't speak to each other. Yeah. So as a neuropsychologist, I'm curious, is it ever too late for the neuropathways to change? Is, is there an empath who is too old or too wired in a certain set of you know, ways of thinking and, and brain patterns to be able to do what we're talking about? Or are the brains really malleable enough that, that anybody can change the way that their brain is functioning? They don't have to be a, um, let's say like a wounded empath for the rest of their life. Is, is there enough neuroplasticity to be able to shift that regardless of where we are in life and what's happened? Yes, because uh, and that's a great question too. Yes, you can. And the reason we're not wired, we're, we're again an ecology, but what rules all of that is the default mode. And if you can change that default mode at 80 or 90 or 20 or 120, same thing. Because it, the brain seeks the causes of health and we interfere with the causes of health. And it's very interesting because centenarians that I've worked with, hundreds of them, and, and the, uh, the things that I've done with uh, Shift on, on Longevity, None of them have that empath kind of thing. None of them. They have healthy narcissism, which is really very good. And, and they may have been empaths at first. Some, some of them came from concentration camps, but, but intuitively they were able to work it out on their own. And you don't see that. You don't see the empaths uh, in the centenaries. Can you say a bit more about healthy nar narcissism? What do you mean by that? What does that look like? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a word that, that George Solomon coined also. Uh, and uh, health, healthy narcissism is really a uh, self-esteem disorder. When you see these people, oh, I'm so great. It's, it's a compensation, overcompensation for a, for a uh, uh, problem. But I'll give you an example with centenarians. So examples are the best way to, to explain science. I went to Cuba to um, work to look at some centenarians. And one centenary, they, they give him a party and there were women at the party and he came, came over to me and he said, have you noticed how the women are in love with me? That's narcissistic. Second, empathic or the, the um, healthy narcissism, he said, have you noticed how beautiful they are? All of them. So you see, you bring love into you and you take it out. So it's within you. Powerful. But they see that. And when they say, for example, I meet you and I've known you in two weeks, Melissa is one of the most beautiful person I've ever met. I, I think she's in love with me. And that doesn't make them be sexual. Yeah? She's in love with me and, and she's wonderful. That kind of inclusive process is what's really good for the immune system when you have that. And they all have the, the, that, uh, that sense of uh, healthy narcissism. A woman, 102, I asked her. I, she was really pretty, very attractive. And I said, you're a very attractive woman. She says, I know, I've always been beautiful. And since I was a little girl, I was beautiful. But what do they teach you? No, no, you never say that because I conceded. So society supports bad empathy and supports unhealthy narcissism. Because if you can't be narcissistic about in a good way, then you're going to be in a bad way. Wow. Dr. Martinez, you are just a wealth of information. For people that are listening that want to learn more from you, can you tell us about um, how they can find you online, how they can learn from you, work with you, all of those sort of things? Yes, the, the, the best way is uh, biocognitive.com, my website. But there's a lot of free stuff on, uh, on my YouTube channel. I have over 200 videos there. And it's just Dr. Mario Martinez. That's, that's my channel. And then uh, also, I have a, a course that I did with Shift uh, that's at Anything you want to know about longevity is there. So I would suggest that you go there and uh, sign up for the course. It's, it's, it's on demand now. But basically, uh, you'll get all the information on my website, everything that's going on, all, all the mentoring that I do. But what I try to do is, uh, getting back to your question, I, I try to retrain the brain independent of how old you are. And it doesn't matter how old you are. Centenarians think that the present is never too late to make decisions. I love that. The president is never too late to make decisions. And it's so um, 
nurturing to hear that it's never too late because I think a lot of us, myself included, even though I'm, you know, I'm in my forties, sometimes feel like I've missed the opportunity or my, you know, my way of doing things. It's too, I'm too set in it. My, you know, my brain isn't, isn't able to shift or, you know, create these, these new ways of thinking and doing things. So to hear from you, who is a a master in understanding and studying the brain, that it's never too late, that it is uh, possible. The brain is malleable. The, the potential is there feels really comforting. Yes. And, and the reason that that happens that we start giving up is because we intellectually try to change it. We say, this isn't working for me. I have three relationships and all three of them abandoned me. What's wrong? Well, I'm not going to do it anymore. It doesn't work. You have to go to the default mode and find out what is the love connection you bring and speak uh, abandonment fluently. And then there are methods of doing it. And, and then it changes. And when it changes, then hope comes back up. The worst thing for the immune system is hopelessness. The moment that you go into hopelessness, natural killer cells go down, antibodies go down, and you're prone to catch anything that's going on around. So hopelessness is is it's really a disease. It's it's like the you know the silent killer that um, just from the inside out kind of rots us essentially. You no longer have access to resources to overcome a challenge, or you don't know what the resources are. So you give up. That's it. They do it with rats. You can you can create uh, physiological helplessness with rats. You shock them, shock them in a place where they can't move. Uh, no escape uh, paradigm. And they begin to secrete endorphins uh, to, to protect themselves. And they you shock them and they don't move anymore. At that time, their natural killer cells and immunological responses go down and you inject them with cancer and it just grows. Wow. But if you put them into empowerment where you teach them how to press a lever and then you don't shock them, natural killer cells go right back up again. So that's good news. So it sounds like the most powerful medicine that we could give to an empath is to remind them that compassion is really the way that compassion is the uplifter it's the um the, the antibiotic in the metaphor yes the the best medicine for an empath is to feel selfish because when they feel selfish that means they're doing something for themselves and then to feel compassion later so i would say for a couple of weeks try the things that we talked about to the point where you can do selfing and you already have the brain knowing, okay, this is me, this is it. Then you never be empathic, be compassionate. And then and then it goes right up. But for a while, don't even try compassion. Just be compassion, compassionate with yourself to get that brain to change the default mode. And then you can start having the luxury of being compassionate with others. Thank you so much. I love your ability to blend the wisdom of 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 this ancient eastern um, practice with the 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 new research that we have here in the west and and taking the best from both and giving it to us and and to our listeners that they can move through their lives feeling healthy selfishness compassion and uplifted thank you so much mario a pleasure to talk with you thank you everyone for joining us thank you very much